Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Sorry, that was my fault. That was my fault. Um, so good to be with you. Um, with holidays and all, I feel like I haven't been here for so long. Um, but it's lovely to, to, to be with you. I was up in Fermanagh last week. Um, and uh, so it's good to, be, good, good to be back in the house. And uh, it's kind of funny, you know, because uh, Rick was talking about the family fun night. The family fun night on Friday night actually celebrates our 27th birthday. We're 27 years old as a church on the 8th of September by the date. This day, this day, the first Sunday of September, 20 years ago, I stood in this platform for the very first time. This was our first Sunday into this building um, 20 years ago today, 2003. And then another interesting thing, 22 years ago um, tonight, 22 years ago tonight, I preached in the little um, house, outhouse at the farm in Donna and I preached on decisions. And a young guy in his 20s that night was there that I knew well. And I went down and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Dixie, you have a decision to make tonight. And Dixie's hard, macho man, but the tears came. And they flowed and he gave his heart to the Lord. So it's amazing, isn't it, when you celebrate anniversaries and things like that and you realize what God has done. A lot has happened and a lot has changed in uh, 20 years, and 22 years, and 27 years, um, some good things, some horribly bad things, and uh, but God is in the midst of it all. But we begin this new term. Um, <clears throat> you like our new graphic? This um, month, all of this month, you're going to be watching Dave and Rick and I do a little dance together. That's going to look good, isn't it? Um, uh, we will be um, hosting um, and, and leading you through this next month, the month of September, around the idea of compass, around sort of mapping our way ahead. So September, as Rick says, is a kind of a crazy month. Everything starts back. Everybody is everywhere. And um, that's the way it is. But it seems like also it's a great month. It's a great time to have an opportunity to kick start things again and reset some rhythms and because summers are long um, it used to be years ago some of you who are older will know that it was the 12th fortnight and that was it the holidays were 12th fortnight and then everything went back it's not like that anymore holidays seem to span from middle of june to um, now and uh, although the weather here hasn't been that brilliant the wettest july in history i think but um, anyway, as a church, we like to take advantage of this month. We like to take advantage of a new start. And um, September brings uh, us to resetting some of our core beliefs and values. And, um, and Dave and Rick and I will do that together over. And we're going to keep communion to the end each of the weeks. So just to celebrate it with communion, we're going to, as a response at the very end, we're going to um, have communion together, sort of re-establish and re-stamp our vision um, for what we're going to do over the next season. Some of those, some of you who have been around for a while, this you'll probably have heard some of this before, um, but apparently, um, if you have heard it before, apparently it takes seven to nine times to hear something before you actually take it in. Did you know that? So, there you go. Um, and for those of you who are new, we hope this is helpful. Um, we really do want you to feel part of things. And obviously, some of you in the room today might be on your own spiritual journey at the moment, discerning where the Lord's leading you. And if we're just a stepping stone to where God is leading you, that is completely fine. We hope that you find a safe place here to do that. But if you are considering making this your home, and um, we want you to know, and we would love that too, and we'd love to chat to you. We're all, always open to coffees. Um, um, so I hope that this morning will be really informative for you. I think it will. All right? Now, the reason it's good for us to go over stuff like this is because it's really important to have some kind of a common script. It's really important that we understand this common script together and what the Lord is leading us into. Because language helps to shape culture, all right? 
and we, we learned this over the years, if, if you don't have values, values create culture. That's what happens. Values create culture. But if you don't have values, the culture you live in will create your values for you. So it's really important to get the horse before the cart with that one, all right? Your values create the culture rather than letting the culture create your values. So trying to get some language that defines and recognizes um, some of the core of who we are is really important. And that's why a common script is vitally important. And of course, in all of this, we want to be guided by Scripture. We want the Bible um, to teach us that, to found it in Scripture, because there's no, uh, no point in us just coming up with strategies and ideas and vision that's not biblically um, founded, so it's important to do that. And so it's, this is what inspires us. This is what guides us, all right? And so our guide over the next few weeks, over the month of September, will be the book of Acts, um, which is an incredible book. It's not just a history book. Somebody said this to me recently, Phil, you've got to be careful that you don't build everything you do out of a history book. And I said, no, it's not, it's not, a, it's not just a history book. It is telling you the early beginnings of the church, but it's setting a foundation in, uh, that we can contextualize and learn out of how this early church grew. And so it's more than just a history book, all right? Um, now, Acts is a part two of Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. He also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so it's part one. So it, you can sort of look at, at them almost like a part one and part two. Uh, and so Acts is sort of a sequel to his book in, in, in Luke. And it's a very, in it, he, he sets a very strong pattern for the book. It's really important. You'll, you'll find this um, in Luke chapter one. I love this. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitness and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Do you see this? He says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. So he's writing an orderly account of this. He is He is analyzing this, and Luke wants his friend Theophilus to know with certainty the reality of what Jesus has done. And these opening words in Luke chapter 1, he reminds us all of this. And then when you go to Acts chapter 1, he, he, he reminds him of what he told him in the gospel of Luke and he, and now what's about to happen through the church. So when you go to Acts 1, um, reading the first eight verses, he talks about his former book. He said, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Uh, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he said this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. He said, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now the thing I want you to notice about this is the emphasis Luke puts on the fact that he, he's writing an orderly account of events. This means Luke has patterned his gospel and the book of Acts in a particular way to tell us something. He wants us to know something, all right? He has architected the book so it will be useful not just to Theophilus, his friend, but also to the churches down through the ages for us. Now, the word, the name Theophilus means lover of God. That's what the name means, lover of God. And while he was most likely a real person, we can also apply Luke's account of the early church to all the people who love God, to us here today, to all the lovers of God. So that's why I'm saying that it's not just a history book. It's a, uh, and while the story of the unfolding of the Great Commission of Jesus happened in the first century, there's no doubt about that, and we should try to understand the context of that different than ours in many ways. There's no doubt about that. In other ways, the principles throughout the 
Um, the, the, the book of Acts gives us what we call normative practices. There's things that we can take and make our own that we can learn and how we establish local church right down through the ages. And so here's the way that we can understand the book of Acts. If we try to uh, dissolve it, firstly, we see uh, that Luke has architected the book to tell us the big picture of how the early church grew over the first 30 years, um, give or take a year or two. So over the book of Acts takes in a 30-year period. You probably know that. So, um, and so uh, this, the, Jew, you, the first six chapters, you have the whole Jerusalem movement uh, through Judea. Then seven and eight, you have Samaria. Then you have 10 and 13 from the house of Cornelius. In chapter 10, you would go into the Gentiles. Then Acts 16, we see Paul heading out to Macedonia, the Macedonian call going to um, the Europe. And then finally, in Acts 28, getting to Rome and even as far as Spain. And so the Acts is a story of what Jesus said was going to happen, did happen. (laughs) That's basically, so Luke's, all of this gospel about the life of Jesus, Acts is actually now telling us that all of what Jesus said would happen, this is how it did happen in the first 30 years of the church. And the key question that we should ask as we go through the the book of Acts is how do we locate our story? How do we put our story in this church, in Emmanuel, into the big story, into the unfolding of the Great Commission? And there are key practices, there, there are normative practices out of the book of Acts that we can make ours to make sure that the church grows. And this is something that we have sought throughout the years as a church, as I say, 27 of those to be precisely. And this is what, and I think what you'll find is that as we do stuff like this, we will reference the book of Acts a lot um, for any major decision we're going through as a church. Why would we do that? Because of the normative practices, because we want to see how it worked back then and how it established itself in our context. How does it work out? And so over the next few weeks, we'll describe some of our key ministries, we'll, we'll describe some of our leadership structures, and we will reference Acts a lot in that, all right? Uh, and that's just because we want to get inside of what the big picture of Acts is all about, and um, we've been, been inspired by the Holy Spirit to do that. Now, most of you who have been about a little while will know our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craig Evan. Uh, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the kingdom of God. We established that out of the book of Acts, that we wanted to be a strong local church, that we wanted to be salt and light. So um, so there, a light where people can come to and salt is expended that goes out. And so it's really important to do that. And throughout the years, we've tried to crystallize this vision more and more, and it has become more and more enriched over the years, and it guides in all that we should do. Now, vision is a really important thing because people... Without a vision, perish. We say people without a vision move, perish. But uh, it's kind of, both are kind of true, all right? So it's really important. People without a vision, the Bible says, perish. And so vision should always be the compelling picture of a preferred future, a dream we're living for and aspiring towards, something that we will spend our whole lives longing to see and give our lives for whether we see it or not. That's so important. We're not just doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for our kids. I'm doing this now for my grandkids. This is something, this is the legacy that we leave behind. And in order to fulfill vision, what we did was we, 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 we tried to get um, six big long-term aims, that uh, long-term aims, key goals, you could say, that map out a broad strategy of how we fulfill our vision. And these aims give us a clear direction of travel. So when we meet, you mightn't hear these six aims an awful lot, but we hear them an awful lot. And we sit in meetings and we discuss how we're doing in these six long-term aims. Don't um, worry. I'm just, I know there's loads of information to take in this morning, but don't be panicking too much. It's just to try and give you a, a sort of a broad brush stroke. So we posture and prepare ourselves to help steward a move of God's Spirit in Ireland. We create a culture of radical discipleship that releases a movement of people fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, We build a mature, local, thriving local resource church, release an apostolic movement of church plants around Ireland, 
um, conceive and implement citywide transformation initiatives for the Craigavon area, and we train and release leaders through a mature leadership development pipeline. And as I say, you mightn't hear those a lot, but we talk about those a lot, especially in senior lead team. And these aims guide what we do, they guide what we invest in, they guide who we employ, they guide how we structure things. They're very, very important to us. And it's actually really encouraging to see many of the dreams come true. Um, Lynx, which is part of us, uh, that Laura is the CEO of, which is an incredible job. Um, Lynx Council and Community opened a new center in Lisburn on Friday. That's nine centers across the north. Um, and I think she deserves a round of applause for that. Uh, um, thousands and thousands of counselling hours, thousands of people whose lives have been changed with the vision of no one should stand alone. I think it's a great vision. But when, 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 when we started to write this, links didn't even exist. When we started to write these things, there were no such thing as missional communities. Um, in Cara and Craig Evan, Shalom, down in Victoria Street, Rua and in Warringstown, uh, Mournview with Willie and Barry now and the guys. Um, none of those existed. Many of those people didn't even know Jesus at that time when we were writing these visions. Emmanuel Porter Down didn't exist. There was no such thing as the bar network of churches. There was no NUA. There was no citywide projects. There was no leadership pathway. None of that existed. And so it's quite a... And now you see, you see vision unfolding because we've had vision. And we, some of these... I, I was thinking last night, um, late on last night, I was thinking of the original vision was to be uh, a, a family, a hospital, and an army. And when we bought here... Back um, in 2022, moved in in September, um, or t t moved in in September 03. I remember Miles Wilson saying to me, Phil, what's the most important of those three to you? And of course, the right, there's no right answer, but I thought the right answer was family. And I said to him, well, family, Miles, is the right answer. And he said, well, Phil, why would you bring your family to a war zone? We said, on the peace line. Of, of the Protestant Catholic culture in a very divided town. He said, why would you ever bring your family to a peace line or to a, a war zone instead of to a peace line? And I thought, oh, that's a really good question. And I think you'll see the answer in a moment or two because as we came out of COVID and we tried to discern a sense of vision, which, by the way, was discerned with many, many people, many of you in the room. This went over the course of probably about a year um, with elders, with our board, with our staff, with key people in the room. We did a couple of days where we did a couple of Saturdays here. We put big boards around the room. We invited you all to come and write up dreams and visions on those things. We correlated all that. We pulled that all together. We prayed about this for months and months and months. And so... Um, what we did was then we came up with a, a sort of a short-term vision video, um, which we showed in January past, and the aims described above will come through in the video. So let's take four or five minutes and watch the little video and see, um, and then I'll come back just before Dave comes up um, to share a little bit about life rhythms. Watch the screens. Vision 2030. The vision of Emmanuel Church is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. The last few years have been disorientating to say the least. Our generation is facing some of the biggest cultural challenges in decades. As we navigate post-Covid world, political systems are broken, economies are failing, our communities are fractured and many people are lost. Hope is in short supply. Yet it's these types of moments in history where God breaks in stirring up a remnant of his people with holy passion to see the glory of the Lord manifested on the earth. The Church of Jesus Christ should be a community of people who carry and embody a vision and imagination of another reality breaking into this world, the hopeful, compelling reality of the Kingdom of God. And so as we step into 2023, we do so with holy ambition to see the vision God has given us fulfilled. As a leadership, we've listened to our fellow elders, our staff, and you, our church family. Prayerfully, we've discerned a step forward structured under our six long-term aims, 
which we believe will help us and shape us in the vision God has given us to be fulfilled. That vision to rewrite the story of Kurgavan, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the kingdom of God. Number one, posture and prepare ourselves to help steward a move of God's spirit in Ireland. To see 24-7 night and day of prayer happening across our churches, to grow as a national hotspot of prayer and worship, and to spearhead a movement of intercession in Ireland. To partner with other churches to host an all-Ireland festival called Nua. It is our desire that over the next decade we will gather with thousands of people from all ages to contend for a great awakening across this island. Number two, create a culture of radical discipleship that releases a movement of people fulfilling the Great Commission. To establish a disciple-making culture, disciples making disciples, commissioning everyone to join Jesus in mission, both across the street and across the nations. Develop a pathway to wholeness and freedom, which integrates biblical teaching, prayer ministry, deliverance and professional counselling in order to see thousands set free. To embed a shared set of life rhythms in the heart of our church community, inspiring the whole family towards ever-increasing Christ-likeness. Number three, build a mature, thriving local resource church. The establishment of Emmanuel Portadown in the new building, maturing Emmanuel Church, Lurgan and Portadown as an apostolic hub in our city and Ireland while hosting people from the nations where they will be inspired and equipped. Together we want to invest in our current generation of kids and youth, discipling them in radical obedience to Christ through all of our environments. To establish a consistent and clear gospel advancing strategy to win the lost of our city, witnessing people coming to Jesus on a daily basis. Number four, release an apostolic movement of church plants around Ireland to plant 10 new churches throughout Ireland over the next 10 years. We have a dream of a strong, established, thriving resource church in the south of Ireland. Number five, conceive and implement citywide transformation initiatives for the Craigavon area. To develop our facilities as more than a functional space, becoming a place to dwell, a place of connection, great coffee, an authentic, life-giving community. To grow as a recognised centre of excellence for well-being in our community, providing both practical support at the point of need and empowerment to encourage people to thrive in life. To become a centre for community education and vocational learning, equipping people with qualifications and experience to develop a career, an area of creative expression or the skills to transform their community. In addition to what happens in our buildings, Citywide Transformation is about the everyone, every day, everywhere expression of our faith as we see our communities transformed. Therefore, we will seek to empower more people from our church to make a difference where God has placed them in business, schools, sports clubs and neighbourhoods. We will also develop strategic opportunities to partner with other organisations to serve our local community and see our area transformed with the love of Jesus. Number six, train and release leaders through a mature leadership development pipeline. To establish a high level leadership development pathway aimed at raising up local church leaders, church planters and kingdom entrepreneurs and to mobilize them throughout the nations. To establish a distinct culture of spiritual mothering and fathering throughout the whole body so that intergenerational learning and formation can take place. The Bible says without a vision the people perish. And so may the Spirit give us the courage to lean forward together into all that God has for us. And in doing so, see the inbreaking of the kingdom of God and welcome many into his family. Good. So rather than fire a fresh vision at you every year, we sense that um, these vision and aims will guide us as we go forward. These are our long-term aims and the flexibility that comes in in our short-term aims that's what everybody was saying out of under each one we have these short-term aims which are the way we believe we should strategically focus our mission um, in the next term and um, and I think what that does it helps us stay in step with the spirit I think that's uh, the guide and the day-to-day and responds 
uh, we can respond because so much changes and we've lived long enough to know that life can turn in a penny. But what is important to emphasize is that in these aims, we hope we're not simply just a corporation. We don't want to become um, just a, uh, uh, having these sort of strategies that aren't informed are bailed in the power of the New Testament. And because what we read in Acts 2 is not so much about birthing an organization, but the beginnings of, or the beginnings of a massive institution, but more a family-based thing. And so when we think of that sort of dynamic people movement, unlike the world has ever seen, so when you read the first six chapters, whenever Paul um, and the apostles were saying, it's not good for us to wait on tables, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people had got saved. Like you've 3,000 people in Acts 2, you've 4,000 people in Acts 4. So the church has grown by maybe 10,000 people plus in a, in a very short time. And so they're beginning to realize that somebody in the, somebody in the organization, while all of the horizontal day-to-day stuff had to be done and had to be done really well, somebody needed to do this. Somebody needed to give themselves to the word and to prayer. And so sometimes we can miss the vertical because we're so busy doing the horizontal. And they're both really, really important. And so um, what, what Acts 2 begins to form for us is how this formed. How, how did all, all of these things started to, started to operate out of a family? Now, I know we can use that phrase very glibly in church. And I'm being careful with that because we are a family, but we're a family on mission. And so when you come to this passage in Acts 2, I love this little phrase. It says they devoted themselves, devoted themselves. How's your devotion today? Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the break and the bread and the prayer. That's it. They devoted themselves to teaching, to break and bread, to prayer had a fellowship, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They had a common script, and on and on it goes, and God added daily to those who were being saved. And so Acts then tells us the story of both a movement and a family. And here's why, whenever I thought years after Miles' question, why would you bring your family to a war zone? Why? Because we're a family in mission. We're a family in mission. All right? And we have given you vision and aims and show how the movement applied. And we define that under a family. And so what we decided many years ago, our values would build us as a family. So as a family, we could teach you how to love God, how to love people, how to love the world, not just as a church, but as a family. How do we do that in our neighborhoods? How do we live that out where we live? And it's obviously the first church that that, that, that in Acts, the whole thing was they were devoted to these things. They were devoted. They were a covenant community. They kept together, but they had this white-hot devotion which was sustained by rhythms and practices. All right? You get it? So the movement works the family, and the family works the movement. They're a bit like those things on the engine wheels that keep turning and turning. And all along this is really important. So everything the early church did was fueled by devotion. Their love was hot. They surrendered their life, so it was changed. It was reflected in their lifestyles. Their love looked like something. Their discipleship was radical. They followed Jesus in all of life. And that's what our discipleship program does. Teaches you how to follow Jesus in all of life. And so to, to try and boil that all down, while you don't see our six long-term aims very often, you do see our six practices which are along the wall. And these six practices that are along the wall are the key practices that we see in the life of Jesus. And so basically, if you wanted to put them under our values, you can see prayer and worship, creativity under loving God, teaches us how to love God. Hospitality, justice, and compassion that Rick was talking about are under our loving people, and then our mission um, and our making disciples under the loving the world. And so this is the way it all works. And so if you wanted to boil it all down, if you wanted to boil it all down, you could boil it down to this. We have one vision. We have six long-term names which belong to the movement, which teach us how to be a movement and keep going. Our vision, rewriting the story of the city, Ireland and the nations, the six long-term names, teaches us how to be a movement. The three core values and the six practices teach us how to be a family. 
We should love God. We should love people. We should love the world. And we should do all of these things. And as we do all of these things, this is, this is how it happens. Now, Dave is going to come up and talk to us for a few minutes about how we can actually do that practically. And then I'll come back and lead us into communion as we finish. Thanks, Dave. Morning, everyone. So yeah, listen, just uh, briefly for a few minutes, some of this language which Phil has alluded to and the reality of it, the part that's caught me even as we, we focused on it this week, uh, the language that you use, Phil, around this idea of common script, normative practice, these big words which we're talking about, these all boil down to look like something in our lives, what you've just finished, Phil, by alluding to, that to be able to sustain devotion like what that's simply meaning for the early church where they had certain rhythms and practices there to help them to sustain their devotion to Jesus. We all want to be devoted, don't we? There's moments where we feel that level of what we just sang at the start, stir a passion, God, to help us to stir up. And be it, what are some of the rhythms and practices that we can embed in our lives to help us to sustain that? And as, and as we come to this, just very briefly, this is why you will have heard over the last number of years we've talked about this. For us as a church community, what are some of the life rhythms which we would center ourselves on corporately, be it also individually in our lives over the last few years? Again, Ryan Vision Sundays, we've always uh, pulled these out, these life rhythm cards. And what we encouraged us to do was to be... Asking and seeking the Lord for ourselves, there are certain things corporately which we are encouraging you to embed in together with us. We'll be drip feeding many of those over the, over the coming weeks. But yet for you individually, as we look at each of these different areas under prayer, under your family, your relationships, your mission, work, your rest, health, would you as a, as a individual in this season, there, many of you have, have seen these before, there's, there's a lot of these that are sitting down at the connections desk at the back. If you've had one before, you can grab it. If you've never seen these, take one of these with. We would encourage you, our encouragement is to get before the Lord and individually seek God for yourself and ask, what are some of the rhythms I can embed in my life in this season to, be, to help me sustain my devotion to the Lord? That's the purpose of what this is about when it comes to the life rhythms. And, and in this, when it comes to the corporate element of it, there are certain new things which we're excited to be able to talk about for you. And so one of the things I want to just mention this morning, next week, uh, we're really excited to say next Sunday we are going to be releasing to you our new church app, right? Our new church app, which is helping all of us. We all have one of these, a phone. I'm sure most of you have. Um, we... We have one of these, and, and in this, now with the new app that's going to be released, it's helping us to actually have an accessibility to some resources and some tools that help us to center ourselves and what are some of the practices and rhythms which we can embed ourselves in corporately to help us to sustain, again, our devotion to Jesus. And so next week, we're really excited to talk about this a lot. Steve Dumford has done an incredible job. We had a big week this week where we, we said to the elders, Apple actually turned down our app. Can you believe it? Boo, let me, hear, let me hear a boo, boo, there we go, seems like the pantomime, doesn't it? And uh, we prayed about it, we, we chatted about it as elders, we prayed uh, together and Steve the next morning woke up and he felt he had a bit of a hunch, you know, that he maybe just to tweak one thing and he tweaked it and Apple came straight back to say, you're in, we've accepted you, way, right? So suddenly we like Apple again and uh, at one point... Android had accepted us. What we were thinking was we were going to encourage all of you to ditch your Apple phones and just buy Android just to be able to do this. But it's, everything's worked around with this. And so next week, we're really excited to be able to talk about this, to be able to release it to you, this app that allows us in terms of some of our rhythms, again, to be able to sustain. In terms of the early church, one of the ways they devoted themselves, obviously, was through their serving. Um, the reality is for the early church, um, they, they gave themselves, they realized that for the family to work together, they needed the family to work together to allow this to work. In terms of who we are as a church, the family needed to work together to make this work. 
And so for you as part of our family over again, the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about all the serving opportunities that are available within church. It's, we would love you to be part of many of our teams and to help uh, within that together. And one of the ways we devote ourselves, obviously, is to be a people of prayer in this season. Off the back of these four weeks, there's a, a different series we're going to be pressing into. We're going to be releasing and talking about some of the new prayer rhythms, which we would love to see embedded as part of who we are as a church family. And yet, one of the key areas for us with that is corporate prayer. In this season, we're calling it one thing. This is our focus, the one thing that we would seek together. We'd be a people that would come and we would pray. And our encouragement to you is that you would devote yourself to come and join with us on Wednesday nights in our corporate prayers. Next week, we're going to be talking a lot about life groups as well. We're going to be releasing and sharing some new life groups that are available for people to join into in this season, but our devotion to pray. And then finally, just um, as Phil is coming up just in the next couple of minutes, just to center us around the table. Finally, that we would be a people that would give. Uh, and as part of that, obviously, it's, it's with, our, with our money, with, with our tithing. Many of you will remember at the end of last season, we, we had a moment where I, I shared and I taught on tithing in the church. And at that stage, I brought up my buckets from B&Q. Um, I don't know where they're even at now. They're, they're somewhere. And, but this is probably an easier way just to put it on the screen for you than to do that. And so what we were sharing at that stage, if you're new to us, this is, this is a practice this is a practice which we are devoting ourselves to together is in terms of what we have received from the Lord, we give back onto him. And what we see actually, just briefly for two minutes, what we actually see scripturally, this is what we reference at that stage. Here's my sermon down in one or two minutes. What we saw at that point was that in terms of when it comes to tithing, many people in their heads think, well, that's just an Old Testament thing. That's an old covenant thing. That's old language. We don't need to be worried about that. And what we taught is that when it comes to tithing, tithing was a godly principle which we read in the book of Genesis even before it becomes law in the book of Leviticus. So if we're talking about old covenant language where it's laid down as law in the book of Leviticus, it's a godly principle from the very beginning, from the outset that we see in the book of Genesis. Go and listen to the sermon. I'm not going to unpack it all now, but it's a principle for us to live by. And so what we saw with this, the principle of giving a tenth, at the very least, so and as a foundation, here's a wee red circle around this orange bucket, one out of ten buckets. This orange bucket is showing that this is as we give on to the Lord. You could also look at it. This Jesus talks about it. He says, render, give unto the Lord what's the Lord's, and render unto Caesar what's Caesar's. If we're thinking about it in terms of our taxes, there's another one of our buckets, which we're giving. We're a people that give unto the Lord. And yet we're a people that obviously we pay our taxes, we do all of those sort of things. And then we, we were looking at this, we had all these buckets lined along the stage. You see all the rest of them that's left there. You see, Jesus says this, he hasn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And what he's saying is that it's that he's, in, he's leading us and teaching us as his people how to live fully into these things. Is that while there's a baseline and a foundation which we can and experience the fullness of life God has, Jesus actually comes and says, I'm not actually just trying to show you how to live like with the bare minimum. I'm here to show you how to live fully into this. And so Jesus was saying, actually, with everything that we have, these other eight buckets, how do we as a people live a life of generosity? How do we people live lives live, live fully under the Lord? And in this um, season, Phil, why don't you come up just as I finish this with you? As in this season, one of our encouragements to you uh, and our leading to you as a people is that we, uh, we have recognized that with many of the things that the Lord's been leading us into, we've had we've new staff that are beginning. There's been lots of, obviously, you all know this yourself, just cost of increase, all those different things that have been going on in culture. As a church, we just want to make you aware. We've recognized and we, we feel that we're... Um, we're, we're probably living at the minute with about an eight and a half percent deficit of, in terms of the, the definite monies that come into church, there's always monies that come in gifts week, week upon week. But in terms of the definite monies where people have by standing order and all of those sort of things, there's about an eight and a half percent deficit. And yet we believed in faith with elders. We feel in faith. And here's, here's the good thing that I want to say to you this morning. As we've stepped down in faith, month upon month, God has been meeting this month after month after month with us. And yet we want to say this morning that in this moment, if we are devoting ourselves as a family together, what we see in the early church, as Phil's been referencing this morning, is that they devoted themselves in this way. And so here's, here's what we would 
here's our encouragement to you this morning. As you bring this before the Lord, so if you think about, our encouragement is that with your orange bucket that you would at the very least be tithing onto the Lord your 10% and giving it into the house. I wonder with some of those other buckets as part of our generosity and how we practice it. You see, one of the things that happened actually with one of the job rules, someone from church who ties, who gives out of their orange bucket, actually said they felt the Lord leading them that for, the, for one year, they were out of their other buckets as a principle of generosity. They were going to pay for that role for a year. They tithe, they give their orange bucket, but out of one of the other buckets, they thought, I want, I want to invest in that role when they heard one of the rules they're being advertised. And so here's one of the things that just really, many, many are thinking, for goodness sake, you're always talking about money. Very simply, this is what it can mean for you. If you're a person that ties £100 a month, with an 8.5% increase, if we were saying, actually, as part of our generosity, could we give towards it? Could we contribute? It simply, it just looked like this, £108.50. It's £8.50 extra a month. Here's the figures for two. If you're a person who ties £200 a month, it simply means that you're giving another £17 a month on top of your tithe. If you're a person that ties £300 a month, it means that you're now going to be tithing 320 not tithing, you're still tithing your £300, but as part of your generosity, it's £25.50 extra month. Lenny was simply saying it this way. He messaged me this morning. If we had roughly even around 500 families that increased their giving by £200 a year, he broke it down that that's £3.85 a week, the price of a cup of coffee. Lenny obviously goes to the really posh places for his coffee. If you get your coffee at McDonald's, like like me, that's two cups of coffee a week, right? That if you were setting that aside and giving it in terms of a principle of our generosity, we give on to the Lord out of our tithing. But if we could devote ourselves in this way, this is what allows us to sustain our devotion. This is what allows us to sustain much of what we are doing in an ongoing way as a church family, just simply by our increased heart of our togetherness and our generosity in these ways. And as Phil comes now just to lead us around the table, simply this is what we're saying. Devotion looks like one thing, but what are some of the practices and some of the rhythms that we put in place to help us to sustain it? We're going to be drip feeding again, lots of these in the coming weeks uh, around what it can look like. But right now, let's center ourselves around the table. Yeah. I love that little verse where he says he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He gives us seed to sow, and then he gives us bread to eat. <laughs> so we're allowed to have fun with the rest. Amazing, isn't it? That's the beauty of God. Let's just still our hearts. Dixie's going to come. The guys, I'm going to worship just for a few minutes as we close off. Um, we've been talking a lot about devotion this morning, and Obviously, when we come to talk about Jesus, we talk about one who was fully devoted. He was devoted in every way. He was one who was so devoted, he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. This was the reason he came. You were the reason he came. When he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed to his father and said, if there's any other way, could you let this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, I'm devoted, fully devoted. I'm bought in. And not my will be done, but your will. He was the one that, in John chapter 8, could look at the brokenness of his marred creation to this woman who was hauled in front of him caught in the very act of adultery and as a condemning mob wanted to stone her to death he looked at her with compassion and conviction and mercy because according to the prophet Isaiah who prophesied of him the Messiah hundreds of years before he would come he would say a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench and so he looks at this woman while everybody stands with their rocks to beat her to death. And he looks upon the marred creation and he looks at the depravity of sin and he's devoted to the sinner. Absolutely devoted. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
That's the one. This is why we do it. We're not, none of us are that smart to come up with all these things. They're all in here. We're just trying to contextualize what happened in the early church and put it into everyday principles. But all based around the fact of our devotion for him is just because of his devotion for us. The Bible tells us that we actually only love him because he first loved us. And so as we take the bread, little piece of cracker, as we take the cup, we do this in response today to something. We do it in response to saying, God, we're only, we're, we're only devoting ourselves to you because you, you devoted yourself fully. Heaven's greatest treasure was poured out. His body bruised and marred above any other man, again, according to Isaiah. His blood as they rammed that spear up into his heart, through his side, puncturing his very heart. It says that out came blood and water, the sign of a broken heart. The God who would give it all. Paul hit it in the head, didn't he, when he wrote in Romans 12, and he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. He says, actually, it's your reasonable service. It's the least you could do. (laughs) It's the very least you could do. And so, God, I thank you today for Jesus. Thank you that as we come around this table today, that we remind our hearts of the price that you paid. We remind our hearts of your great devotion. We remind our hearts that you were totally sold out. There was no going back. We're reminded in Revelation 12, actually, that there was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And we begin to realize that actually before there was sin, there was a Savior. Before ever sin came into the world, Paul, again, when he writes to the church at Ephesus in 1.4, says this, that you're chosen in Christ before the very foundation of the world. Before he led the plans of the stars and the moon and the sun and the worlds and the universe. There was a heart of love towards the creation that he knew would mess it up. We've just finished the book of Jeremiah and the morning devotions this morning. And we see his long suffering over and over and over and over again. And even when he does send them down into Babylon, it's only for 70 years and he redeems them back again. Keeps taking them back. I said the other night in the prayer meeting, I said that even in God's wrath, his love and his mercy lick out. Even in his wrath, his love and his mercy seem to leak out. He just can't stop it because he's not just a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. He's all of those things. There's two tables at the front. There's two tables at the back. Let's uh, move and uh, let's remember the Lord together as we take this bread and take this cup and then Rick will come up and finish us after we worship. May God bless you this morning. Let's commune together as a response to the great devotion let's get onto our feet walk to a table and say God this morning I am redevoting <laughs> I am redevoting my life to you I'm redevoting my life to a cause I'm redevoting to a city a broken city I'm redevoting to my neighborhood to my family I'm saying God I'm in this because you've devoted yourself to me so God even as we come as we protect right now would you bless this bread would you bless this cup would you minister to us as families together in this house I'm family on a mission a movement and a family combined into one to see the kingdom of God extended not just in our own little community now but even throughout Ireland with the Baileys now in the west coast Bellana, the Zuccarellis heading to Cornwall We just thank you for the influence of our house and we just pray your blessing upon every person this morning in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.